My name is Miss Wood and I'm a St. Tammany Parish Public School third grade teacher. I'm so glad you could join me. In this lesson, we are going to learn about point of view. Our learning target is point of view. I can distinguish my point of view from that of a narrator or those of a character. So, what does point of view mean? Have any idea? Those are some really good thoughts. Have you ever heard the phrase, walk in another man's shoes? It's a way of looking at somebody else's perspective. Point of view is the angle of considering things, which shows us the opinions or feelings of the individuals involved in a situation. In literature, point of view is the mode of the narration that the author employs to let the reader hear and see what takes place in a story, poem, or essay. Today we're reading the story, Duck, Rabbit, by Amy Krause Rosenthal and Tom Lichtenheld. Quack, sniff, You can tell most characters or narrator's point of view using what is said and how it is said in a story. Characters or narrators tell a story from their perspective or point of view. To help distinguish the two points of view for this story, I have put a boy and a girl. But you can imagine any characters. Pay attention to the point of view of each character in the story. Each character will give evidence to try to get the reader to understand his or her point of view. You may agree or disagree from a point of view. You may even form your own point of view. Is it a duck or is it a rabbit? Hey, look, a duck. That's not a duck. That's a rabbit. Are you kidding me? It's totally a duck. It's for sure a rabbit. See, there's his bill. What are you talking about? Those are ears, silly. It's a duck and he's about to eat a piece of bread. It's a rabbit, and he's about to eat a carrot. Wait, listen, did you hear that? I heard a duck sound, quack. That's funny, I distinctly heard a rabbit sound, sniff, sniff. Now the duck is wading through the swamp. No. The rabbit is hiding in the tall grass. There, see, it's flying. Flying, it's hopping. Look, the duck is so hot, he's getting a drink. No, the rabbit is so hot, he's cooling off his ears. Here. Look at the duck through my binoculars. Sorry, still a rabbit. Here, ducky ducky. Here, you cute little rabbit. Oh, great, you scared him away. I didn't scare him away. You scared him away. You know, maybe you were right. Maybe it was a rabbit. Thing is, now I'm actually thinking it was a duck. Well, anyway, now what do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? 
Hey, look, an ant eater. That's no ant eater. That's a Brachiosaurus. The end. On a sheet of paper, create the chart below to represent the character's point of view and the evidence that supports your answer from the story. Do you have a different point of view to add to the chart and evidence to support your answer? I have done the first one for you. The girl's point of view. My evidence is the duck has a bill. For the boy's point of view, I have put the rabbit has ears. Can you add to this chart? Or give evidence to support your own point of view? Good job, I can't wait to see your chart. Now make a chart with evidence or a story using narration to tell the character's point of view on the anteater or Brachiosaurus. Can you imagine the point of view of the animals in this story and what they would say about the humans? Here are some say something or accountable talk stems you can use to discuss this with your family to decide each person's point of view and to show why you consider that to be the right or the wrong point of view. Here are more books to practice point of view. Here's a story written from a different point of view using the characters from this classic story. Which point of view do you agree with and why? Do you have a different point of view? Thank you for watching as we learned about point of view. You did a great job. Remember to keep watching other videos like this one so we can all keep learning together. You can watch lessons daily on STPPS TV or on our website at stpsb.org. See you again soon. Hello, my name is Ms. Vic. I'm a fifth grade teacher with St. Timothy Parish Public Schools. And today I'm going to do a review skill on comparing and contrasting characters. And our standard for this lesson is Reading Literature, 5th Grade, Standard 3. Compare and contrast two or more characters, settings or events in a story or drama, drawing on specific details in the text. Our objectives are to identify the central message, describe the character setting and events using key details from the text. And also, students will be able to make real-life connections from personal experiences. Words used to compare and contrast. These are some words we use to compare, and these are some words we use when we're trying to tell the difference. These are the four vocabulary words that we will use today. The first one is compare, which means to note the similarities. Contrast means to tell the difference. Moral of the story is a message conveyed or the lesson learned. A fable is a short story, typically with animals as characters. Now I am going to read to you the short fable on the tortoise and the hare. The tortoise and the hare. One day a hare was bragging about how fast he could run. He bragged and bragged and even laughed at the tortoise who was so slow. The tortoise stretched out his long neck and challenged the hare to a race, which of course made the hare laugh. My, my, what a joke, thought the hare. A race, indeed, a race? Oh, what fun. My, my, a race, of course, Mr. Tortoise. We shall race, said the hare. The forest animals met and mapped out the course. The race begun, and the hare began such a swift run soon left the tortoise far behind. About halfway through the course, 
It occurred to the hare that he had plenty of time to beat the slow trying tortoise. Oh my, thought the hare, I have plenty of time to play in the meadow here. And so he did. After the hare finished playing, he decided he had time to take a little nap. I have plenty of time to beat that tortoise, he thought. And he cut up against a tree and dozed. The tortoise in the meantime continued to fly on about it. It ever so slowly. He never stopped, but took one good step after another. The hare finally woke up from his nap. Time to get going, he thought. And off he went faster than he had ever run before. He dashed so quickly as anyone ever could have to finish to the finish line, where he met the tortoise, who was patiently awaiting his arrival. Now we're going to answer some questions together. The first question I want to ask you was, who won the worst first? Thank you. The victorious tortoise won the race. Absolutely. Number two, is winning the race most important in this fable? Right. No, it is not. The most important thing is just to stay consistent and take your time. Number three, how can you be like the tortoise when taking a test? Absolutely, taking your time. Number four, what does the tortoise teach the hare? Thank you, yes. He teaches him not to underestimate someone, no matter how good you are, never brag or celebrate until the task at hand is completed. Number five, was there ever a time that you felt so confident about something, but it didn't turn out the way you thought it would? Oh, wow, I know that surprised you. Yes, he said yes. He begged and begged his best friend to foot race him, and he gave his best friend a head start, and his friend won the race. My last question, what does the tortoise symbolize in the tortoise and the hare? Right, absolutely. The tortoise represents a person that takes their time through life so they don't miss anything. And the hare represents how people who rush through life miss the true beauty of it. Now, boys and girls, I hope you enjoyed that. And the moral of the story is to never, ever underestimate someone. Take your time and be steady. Now, we're going to complete this diagram together. On this side, we have the tortoise, absolutely. And on this side, we have the fast hair. So now we're going to pick some characteristic traits and put them in here. The first trait is what? What trait describes the tortoise? Yes, he was so humble. Yes, humble and quiet. Good, thank you. What trait do we have for the hare? He was prideful. Yes, he was. He was so prideful and boastful. Good job. What's the other trait we learned about the tortoise? <sighs> yes, he was really slow. Good job. Thank you. What's the second trait that we learned about the hare? Absolutely, he was fast. Okay. What's another trait we learned about the tortoise? Oh, yes, he stayed focused throughout the whole race. And Miss Vic always tells you to stay focused when you're taking an exam. What is the third trait that the hare had? Yes, he got distracted multiple times. Absolutely, thank you. Now, our last and final trait that we learned about the tortoise. 
Yes, he stayed persistent. Good job. What's the last trait that we learned about the hair? <laughs> Absolutely, he was a quitter. Thank you. Now we're going to note their similarities, what they had in common. Yes, they both was running a race. Thank you. They both was running a race. What's the second trait that they had that was in common? Oh, yes. Confident in their abilities. Yes, they both was confident. I like that. I like being confident. What is the third trait? Thank you. That is the answer I'm looking for. They both are animals. Way to go, boys and girls. Thank y'all. Thank you. What is the last trait? Absolutely. Both were trying to prove a point. The moral of the story is that you can be more successful by doing things slowly and steadily than by acting quickly and carelessly. Thank you for watching as we have learned about comparing and contrasting. You did a great job. Remember to keep watching other videos like this one so we can all keep learning together. See you soon.
name is Mrs. Wright. I am a sixth grade math teacher for St. Timothy Parish Public Schools. And today I am going to teach you the dice game over the hill. Very simple game. It involves basic addition and subtraction, some sequencing, and uh, I know some of my upper level students can turn this into a multiplication game. But for today, I am going to show you the basic addition and subtraction. Um, very simple and all you and need very few materials to play this game. I've come to my classroom so you could see better, but all you need is paper, pencil, or any writing utensil, and three die, okay? So I'm gonna put my die here so you'll be able to see them when I roll them. But the first thing you'll need to do is draw your game board. The game board is simply a hill. with the numbers one through 18 written on it. We're gonna put nine and 10, our numbers in the middle, at the very top of our hill. And then descending on the left side from nine. The object of this game is to mark off your numbers in sequence order from one to 18. And the first person to knock off all their numbers wins. So if I was playing an opponent, I would have my own game board and they would have theirs. So you each need your own paper and something to write with. So the way we begin is the first person is gonna roll three die. And hopefully you can see. Okay. My numbers are one, five, and five. I need to do addition or subtraction to create as many numbers in order as I can. So in this instance, what I need to do is get the number one. To get the number one with two die, I have to subtract. So five minus five is zero, that's not gonna help me. And five minus one is four. That is not gonna help me. Okay, so I am stuck on this round and I have to forfeit my turn. So the next player will go and then it'll be my turn again. Now, for the purpose of this video, I'm gonna show you a good way to start if I rolled certain numbers, okay? So let's say I roll a three, a four, and a five. Okay, let's see what we could do if we rolled these numbers. Now, you're not gonna get to pick your numbers, you need to roll them. But if this would be a great starting roll. What I could do is I could do four minus three, which equals one, so I could mark off my one. I could do five minus three equals two, so now I get to mark off my two, okay? So I'm looking now to see, can I subtract or add to get the number three? Five minus four is one, five minus three is two. I'm looking at my addition, none of those are gonna add up to equal three, so my turn is over. And it is the next person's turn. So as you see here, I was able to mark off multiple numbers using the same three dot, okay? You are only, when you are subtracting, you can only subtract two, but when you're combining them, you can combine all three or just two. So my opponent's turn, and then it's back to me. Okay. I have a six, a two, and a one. The next number that I have to get is three. So I see that I can add my two and my one, so I get to mark off my three. Now I'm working with four, okay? Six minus two equals four. So this is a really good roll for me. So I'm gonna mark off four, okay? Now I'm trying for five. Six minus one is five. This is actually a really great roll. Now, six. How can I get six? Two plus one is three, definitely not six. The only number that I can add to six is zero to get six. That's the identity property of addition, and I can't do that in this game. 
Okay, so my turn is over and it's my opponent's turn. And then I'm gonna do one more round as my own and I hope, hopefully you'll have the idea by then. So my opponent goes and now it's my turn. Get my dice where you can see them. Okay, I have a five, a five and a four. I'm trying to get six by adding or subtracting. Five and four is nine. Five and five is 10, I'm stuck. I have to forfeit my turn, okay? So this is how you play over the hill. And the first person to mark off all numbers to 18 is the winner. Give yourself a air high five. You did a great job. Thank you for joining me. I hope you have fun with your game and join us again soon. Thank you. Hi, this is Ms. Pellegrin and I am a St. Tammany Parish public school teacher. Today we are going to look at a square square pyramid. And so it gets its name because the base of it is a square. So it sits this way. And you can see that we also have some triangles and that's the part that makes it the pyramid. And so we can see we have one, two, three, four triangles and then the base that is a square. So we're gonna talk about surface area. Surface area is the area of all of the surfaces added together. So if you notice on this one, we have four triangles and they are all the same. So I'm gonna just give us a different look at this so that we're not seeing it in this 3D shape. We are able to see it in a flat surface. So this looks like a composite figure. We can see it is a figure that is made up of many different, or not many different, but two shapes, triangle and a square. And so if we measure the surface, the square, when we measure one side, we get 9.6 centimeters. And because it's a square, I know that this side is also going to be 9.6 centimeters as well. And so if I'm looking at my square to find the area of a square, I know I just multiply the two sides together. So I'm going to multiply 9.6 times 9.6 and that gives me 92.6. 16. So the square is 92.16 centimeters squared. That is the area of just the square. And then we have our triangle. And so I'm just going to sketch out a little triangle here. It won't be exact. The bottom of the triangle, if you notice, it should be the same when I measure as the square because in this place it was attached. And so the base of our triangle is 9.6 centimeters. And then I want to measure when it's flat from the bottom to the top to get that height. So from here to here, we know that is our height. And so the height of our triangle is 10 centimeters. So then we want to find our area and we know that area is equal to one half base times height. So the area is 9.6 times 10. So when I multiply 9.6 times 10, I get 96. So the area is equal to half of 96. So I'm just gonna divide by two, and that gives me the area of that triangle is 48. 48 centimeters squared. If we look back though, we know that we had not just one triangle, but we had one, two, three, four triangles. So we need to take that 48 and we need to add it four times, or we could multiply it by four. 
So in total, all of the triangles together gives me 192 centimeters squared. And then we had to remember we have that square at the bottom. So the total surface area of all of the triangles was 192 centimeters squared. And then 92.16 centimeters squared for the square. So when I add those two things together, plus 92.16, I get 284 and 16 hundredths centimeters squared. So there's just a little look at how to find the surface area of a three-dimensional square prism. I hope you follow and watch some more videos. You can keep up with them on stpsb.org. Have a great day. It's that time again, students. I'm so happy to be here to work out with you. I have designed a workout I think you're going to love that you can do by yourself during this time where you can't be with your friends. So take this time to work on you. So I'm going to be right here demonstrating these exercises and working out with you today, but this is something that you can do by yourself at any time of the day. So let's get started. Let's jog in place while I'm telling you a little bit more about this workout. Okay, so we're going to work each exercise for 45 seconds. Then we're going to take a break for 15 seconds. And then start a new exercise for 45 seconds. Now, if you can't do the whole 45 seconds, not a problem. Just do what you can and rest until we start the new exercise. Enjoy it when you can. All right, so I have it all up here on the board. You can see, and hopefully this time is going to work and count down for us. All right, so are we ready? Let's do this workout. Okay. Jumping jacks. Jumping jacks. Woo! Okay. Everyone knows jumping jacks. Okay, I'm gonna do them slow. Feet out, hands up, feet together, hands down. Fast motion. Make sure that you are bringing your arms all the way up over that head. I don't wanna see this. It's all the way up. And smile. Say, I love this. And we can see the time, so we know how much time we have. We have 13 more seconds. And we're starting to get that heart rate up. Feeling good. Up next. Oh, that's up in 15 seconds. Oh, we got that rest coming. I hope you remember to bring your water today. Yes. Woo! Rest. And if you need it, you take a sip of water. Up next. Running man for running 45 man seconds. Is right here. That's our running man. One. Here we go. Okay, that's kind of like if you were just moving your feet, they would be going, um, it's like a skip without the hop in it. And if the arms were going, they're just going up and down. So then you put the arms and the legs in the same motion. And if you don't do it perfectly and you're moving, that's all that matters. Exercise is about moving the body. You always want to try to have good form, but you can work on that. Okay? Up next. Here we go. Five seconds. more seconds. We got that rest coming. Two, one. Yes. Ooh, but I recommend when you're resting, you're still moving. Moving the body. Don't sit down. Tricep push ups. Oh, tricep push ups. Seconds. Let me show you Three, what those are. Two. Okay. One. You want to get on your knees. You're going to put those. Oh, let me go ahead and do ones for those that know how to do it. They can keep moving. And those of you that need a demonstration, you put the hands underneath the shoulders. You want to make sure the buttocks is tucked under. And you want to bring the chest down to the ground. 
Now your elbows are in tight to your rib cage. See, when you're doing a push up, your arms are a little more out. Triceps, your arms are in tight. So when you bend down, they're against your rib cage. It's kind of like right here. So, on your nose. Rest for 15 push. seconds. Well, we got that rest coming, so. Three, two, Ooh, let's get one more one. in there. We got it. Yes. Okay, we now we get to rest. That was a tricep push up that works the back of the arm. But now we have high skips. So that's okay. a hop. And a high knee. Seconds. Hop and a high knee. Three, two, Here we go. One. Woo! High skips. High skips. Oh, this feels so good. I'm so happy that you're here with me exercising, learning some new stuff. Okay, you can skip around. Back. Skip forward. You know what? You can go get anyone in your household and ask them to do this routine with you. You can design your own time on it. If 45 seconds is not enough, you can work out for a minute and rest for 20 seconds. Oh, yes. Rest for 15 seconds. Coach Gonzalez is getting tired. I might need a little more rest. Yes. Okay. Oh, for this football drills coming up. But. I need to take a breather. Up next. Woo! Football drill for four Oh, we're feeling seconds. good? Three. I'm so proud of you. Two, See one. those football drills? Football drill. Okay, for the football drill. It's like you're tapping your feet up and down, but you're doing it in fast motion. Keeping your hands out by your side. Now, if you want to get fancy with it, move around. You can even touch the ground, come back up. Touch the ground, come back up. This is called the football drill. Now, you can go around to each side. You can do whatever you would like, as long as you are moving. Now, if there's some exercises you don't like, do one of the other ones okay. that you've already learned. Rest for 15 seconds. Okay, that rest coming. Three. And if you're working hard, you should One. need it. Rest. Woo! I needed that rest. Oh, now we have that walking plank up. So, this is a walking plank. Up next. Plank. Walking plank up for four Down on your seconds. elbows. Three. Up on your hands. Okay? We have 45 five. seconds. Let's do this. Woo! Awesome. Make sure you don't have your butt up in the air. Make sure you're keeping your body as straight as possible. So you're staying in this while your arms are going down to elbows and then pushing back up. Try to keep the body as still as possible. And if this is too hard, come to your knees and do the same exercise, but just do it on your knees. Now, as time goes on, you will get better seconds. at these exercises. Three, Woo. two, and one. Rest. Rest. Okay, if you need water, remember to grab that water. Okay. Side lunges. Up next. Side lunges so, for 45 seconds. You are going to Three, step out to two, the side. One. Bend side lunges. The leg. Step out to the other side. Bend the leg. Remember, those lunges are 45 degrees in the knees. It is the same thing as that front lunge that I taught you, but you're going out to the side. So it's like you're sitting back on a chair with one leg where the knee is not over the toe, so you're sitting back, but you're stepping out to the side. And the knee, the leg that's stepping out to the side is the one that is sitting back on the chair. And the inner thigh is working on the opposite leg. So it's out to each side. Rest for 15 oh. seconds. I'm glad that rest is coming though. Three, two, one, and rest. Woo, rest. Walk around. See, some of these exercises get you out of breath, some don't. Now this Up one's going to be easy for Roll you guys, but it's going to be hard for me. Three, two. Roll one. up. Coach Gonzalez can't do this one that great. You can probably do it better. So roll back and come up. Woo! You can go each side. Roll back and roll up. Woo, aren't these fun? Now, I know that this is probably easy for you guys, so you can probably come rolling up on two feet together. So, if you can do your feet together when you're coming up, you do that. Coach 
Gonzalez can't do that anymore. But I sure can try. So I'm gonna yes. Woo. for 15 seconds. Okay, Coach Gonzalez is gonna be happy with one leg. One. Rest. Woo! That's called a roll-up. That was tough for me, so. I'll have to work on that one, and that's okay. Up next. Okay, up Star next. For Star Star jump. Seconds. This one Three, is great for all those two, cheerleaders out one. there. Star jump. Star jump. Woo! Now, if you could jump, you could bend down, touch the ground, come up and star jump. Woo! You can holler. Yes! I've got this. Woo! Okay, if you need a break, deep breath, come back to it. Squat down, star jump. Squat down, star jump. Guess what? We've only got one exercise left after this. Wow. And, okay, I'll admit, I need a little bit of a break. Oh, those legs are getting tight, so I'm not going to squat down quite as far. Up next, Woo. rest for 15 seconds. Now I'm going to squat. Three. Star jump. Two. One. Rest. Oh, now I needed to rest on that one. My body worked very hard. Now this last one is going to be for the okay. abs. The abs. The abs. Seconds. So, you can do it here. Two. Lay one. flat on the ground. The abs. Bring your arms off the ground and your feet off the ground. That's called the abs. Now if that's too hard, you want to take your legs up and bring your hands to your toes. So if you can't do the complete V up, where your arms and legs are both off the ground. Just bring your legs off the ground and bring your hands, shoulders off the ground up to meet your toes. So here's the advanced version. Here's the intermediate version. And if that's still too hard, then you need to for 15 seconds. Just keep Three, moving. Two, one, oh, rest. Wow. Now we're done. So, when you're done with an exercise, you should always stretch out a little bit. So, workout you can, to complete that is, three, the workout is two, complete. One. Thank you, man. Okay, complete. so you can bring right leg over the left, bring your hands down to the ground, and stretch your legs out. Now, if you can't reach all the way down, just go as far as you can. And hold that for a couple of seconds. Come back up. Then bring the opposite leg over the, um, <clears throat> stand on the opposite foot and bring the opposite leg over and bend down. I said it that way because I'm sure that if you're looking at me and I'm on my right foot, you're probably on your left foot. So I don't know about you guys, but I'm sweating. I worked hard on that exercise routine, and I hope you got a good I hope you had a good workout today with that exercise routine. And I will keep bringing new ones for you. And you can do this exercise routine by yourself later on today if this wasn't enough. But remember to stretch. So bend down and touch those toes. You can grab your shoelaces and bend at the knee. That's stretching out those quadriceps. And but for now, I'm out of time. So thank you, kiddos. See you for the next PE workout. three different words, pitch, range, and timbre. Second, we will learn about three really important instruments in the brass family. And finally, I'll teach you how to play a real fun game called Instrument Detective. Let's get started. The first word we're going to talk to about today is pitch. Pitch is how high or low a note is. In our last video, we covered a lot about pitch, so if you want to learn more about that, you can go find our last video. Our second word today is range. Range describes how high or low an instrument can play. Smaller instruments usually have higher ranges, and bigger instruments usually have lower ranges. The final word that you need to know is timbre. It's spelled kind of weird, but it's pronounced timbre, T-I-M-B-R-E. 
And what timbre is, is the unique sound that each instrument makes. Timbre is what allows you to know the difference between a piano and a trumpet playing the exact same note. Now that you know what pitch, range, and timbre are, we're going to learn about the brass family. The brass family is made of instruments that are made out of a metal called brass. All brass instruments need to buzz into a mouthpiece to make sound. Buzzing is when you tighten the corners of your mouth like this and force air in between your lips to make them vibrate. It'll sound a little bit like this. When you buzz into a mouthpiece, it sounds like this. If you want to try and buzz at home, you can take a toilet paper or a paper towel roll and you can buzz into it by tightening the corners of your mouth and making your lips vibrate like this. If you do not buzz, an instrument won't make sound. You just blow into it, it sounds like this. When you buzz, it'll start to make a pitch. The smaller a mouthpiece is, the higher it will buzz. And the bigger a mouthpiece is, the lower it will buzz. Small instruments will have a small mouthpiece, letting them play high pitches, and big instruments will have a big mouthpiece, letting them play low pitches. The other way a brass instrument changes pitches is with these metal tubes called valves. When I push down on a valve, it changes how long my air has to travel to make it through the instrument, which changes its pitch. It sounds like this when you play with valves. The first brass instrument I'm going to teach you about today is the trumpet. The trumpet was created about 600 years ago in the 1400s with the invention of valves. The trumpet has three valves and is pretty small, so it has a very high range. If I were to unbend my trumpet, it would have four feet and 10 inches of tubing altogether, about this long. One of the most famous trumpet players ever was Louis Armstrong, the King of Jazz, who was born and raised right next to us in New Orleans. The second instrument we're gonna learn about today is the trombone. The trombone was created in the 1450s, about 50 years after the trumpet. The trombone is the only brass instrument that does not have valves. Instead, a trombone changes pitches with a slide. As the slide becomes longer and the instrument becomes bigger, the pitch will go lower. As the slide becomes shorter and the instrument becomes smaller, the pitch will go higher. Because the trombone is medium in size, its range is gonna be right in the middle. The trombone sound is described like a human voice. If I unwrapped a trombone, it would measure nine feet in length. Another famous New Orleans brass player is Troy Andrews, who earned his stage name, Trombone Shorty, when he started playing trombone in the streets as a young child. The last instrument we're gonna learn about today is the biggest, lowest, and newest, the tuba. The tuba was created about 170 years ago in the 1850s. A tuba can have three or four valves to change pitches with. Because the tuba is so big, it has the lowest range in the brass family. Now, while the picture right here is of a tuba, I'm actually holding a sousaphone, which is made for marching. The sousaphone was created 40 years after the tuba in the 1890s by the famous composer and director, John Philip Sousa. If you unwrapped a tuba, it would be 18 feet long. Now that you know what a trumpet, trombone, and tuba look and sound like, we're going to play a game called Instrument Detective. For Instrument Detective, you have to listen to the pitch, the range, and the timbre of the instrument to figure out which one is playing. The only supplies you'll need to play this game are your ears. But if you want to keep track of points on your own, you can make a scoreboard like this, either to play against Mr. McCord while he plays the different brass instruments, or play against one of your family members. To play this game, each round, you will hear Mr. McCord play a brass instrument twice in a row. During the first time, you will not see what instrument he's playing. During the second, the correct instrument will be uncovered. The rules are, first, you listen to the instrument. Second, you make your best guess as to which instrument's playing. 
And third, you find out if you're right or wrong and you can check it on your scoreboard if you want. One last quick reminder before you play. The trumpet is very small, but gives it a very high range. It sounds like this. The trombone, however, is medium size and it has a slide. You want to listen for that slide in the recordings. It will help you a lot. Let's listen real quick. And finally, the tuba is the largest instrument, so its range will be very, very low. round one. Listen to the excerpt and guess if it's a trumpet, a trombone, or a tuba. Tuba. Trombone. Great job. Here comes round two. This one will have five excerpts all together, so some instruments will be played twice. Tuba. Trombone again. Tuba. This is our last and most challenging round. In this round, Mr. McCord will play instruments high or low in their range to make them sound similar. You will have to listen to each instrument's unique timbre in order to tell them apart. Good luck! Tuba. Trumpet. 
trombone. <laughs> Job. That last round was tricky. Did you beat Mr. McCord? Today we first learned our three vocabulary words. Pitch, how high or low a sound is. Range, how high and low an instrument can play. And timbre, the unique sound quality of an instrument. Then we learned about three very important brass instruments. The trumpet, the trombone, and the tuba. Finally, we played a real fun game called Instrument Detective, where we had to use our ears to figure out what instrument we were listening to. For more online lessons, please check out St. Tammany's other remote learning resources. Thank you, and have a great day. everyone. This is Kelly Blessing with St. Tammany Parish Public Schools. I am a mental health provider. With all the fear that's going on with the coronavirus, I want to tell you some helpful strategies for parents to bring their kids from a place of fear into a place of peace. Limit the news. Kids tend to think about what they're hearing most of. Take a daily walk with the kids. We know from Dr. Francine Shapiro that the right to left motion of walking helps kids to process and resolve emotional situations quickly. Finally, watch an inspirational or positive movie. Follow it up with a positive family discussion. This will help reveal and resolve issues that are on their hearts from the movie to real life application. This is Kelly Blessing, mental health provider with the St. Tammany Parish Public Schools.